Thank you for being here and attending uh, the film. And uh, of course, uh, thank you, Samir, the director of the film, for uh, being here, available to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and Ella Shohat, uh, one of the protagonists of the film. Um, inspired. She inspired the film. The inspiration of the film, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so now we already know an interesting fact. Um, I would like to ask each of you a question uh, before opening up to the uh, audience. Um, my first question would be, um, there is um, the issue of, um, of uh, the Communist Party uh, that uh, actually um, let you go to Israel to discover the former colleagues of your father. And comrades, comrades yeah, yeah, <laughs> as, as we said, Rifa. <laughs> so um, I would like to know uh, what role the Communist Party, or especially the, the Communists in general, played in, in Iraq, in Iraqi society at the time of your father, and what was their role later on in, in Israel and uh, in the participation of, for example, uh, in the Black Panthers, and, what, and how was it important for you to, to follow especially this path. Um, how, how much time do we have? I well, mean, <laughs> these two <laughs> questions led up for a whole evening. Um, shortly enough, I mean, uh, of course, the, the story of my father and uh, that I'm looking after his old comrades was a trick. This is dramaturgy. I'm storyteller, so this is, of fair, course. Fair enough. F yeah. I, but this audience will understand well, because, of course, a film is not an analysis. I'm not writing books, I'm doing films, and films are um, should be emotional in a way to move people. So in that sense, it was really not uh, the first issue. But the Communist Party stands for a position why I have done this film, because in a you know, we can discuss the whole evening about the role of the communists or not. And so on. But the important thing is you have to understand if you say communist, it means in the Arab world in general that you have a secular position, that you are against sectarianism, that you are against the idea that religion should be involved in politics. And that was, of course, my main issue to do the film. Uh, as we know, this is 12 years ago <laughs> and it didn't became, become better, you know? So in that sense, <laughs> yeah, you know, I believe we are over the Senate. We will, we will win, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, of course, we have to stand, and we have to stand for a position. So in that sense, uh, already at that time, everybody told, uh, say, yeah, you know, the communists are not important, blah, 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 and also, okay, but, as I say, we can discuss a lot of details about what mistakes they made, what they happened. You know, in the new film, I'm also following again uh, in Iraq, you this, see this, this way, and I try to answer that on my Shiite, Shu'i, communist <laughs> family. So um, it's always the same story. Uh, I think these people, and in, as in I'm telling in my new film, these people stand for um, an idea of modernity in the Arab world without following colonial ideologies or structures. So the question of communism is really just a metaphor in that way to tell the story of a secular future of the Arab world. Thank you. Um, my second question no, the goes to the question was about the communists in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there would be so much uh, as well to talk about from, from your position as well. But um, my question to you is more about um, the language issue. We have, um, we have the, the writer, which, whose name? Uh, whose name? Samir Nakash. Yes, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Um, so um, he, he is only writing in Arabic, 
and we see him on uh, on Salahuddin Street uh, in the bookstore and everything. So it's very detached, uh, attached to this language. Mm -hmm. um, but um, his son, for example, doesn't understand or speak Arabic. So what role does language play in uh, first generation and second generation? No, I think this is a very important point about the, the question of language. Uh, but I think we have to go back to the Arab world uh, and, and remember that um, the question of, for example, in Iraq, you had diverse languages and diverse dialects as well. Even in uh, the city of Baghdad, uh, you had multiple uh, dialects, the Masih, the Nasrani, the Yehudi, the Muslim, at least that's how we said it. But of course, the, the Nasrani or Yehudi was a Muslawi northern dialect. Uh, it's often referred to jokingly as Qiqo <laughs> because it speaks with a lot of Qa. Um, and then <laughs> in the... <laughs> okay, who am Maslawi? Ahlan wa sahlan, sharafna. And then you have the uh, Baghdadi or the Hajim, what is called the dominant Iraqi dialect, which is more the kind of... Uh, no, uh, southern dialect. So, uh, and even in the film, you actually get to hear mm. yeah. uh, among those four uh, in, uh, interviewees, mm -hmm. actually, the even though they may have spoke the same dialect, they did speak at home the same that dialect that we all spoke in Baghdad. Uh, we would call it in our Jewish Baghdadi dialect, Haki Haki Malihut, Haki Mal Aslam, Haki Mal Nasara. That's how we would uh, refer to it. Uh, however. Uh, it was in the city of Baghdad. Once you go out to Mosul, for example, the distinctions were less uh, visible. But those four men from Baghdad, when they speak to Samir, mm. in the process of being interviewed, and I'll tell you, the crew was a mixed crew. There were yeah. Palestinians uh, who were working on the set. So you get to, to sense that the dialogue actually shifts. Yes. And you hear diverse accents. For example, Sami Mikhail mm. has a lot of Palestinianism in his pronunciation. You know, and you see him working. He worked in El Ittihad. He worked close with Emil Habibi. Yeah. Uh, Shimon Balas, for example, moves uh, mm. from uh, the Fusha to the Muslim Iraq, what we call in, the, in Baghdad the Muslim uh, uh, or the dominant uh, dialect. Um, because he's working. Because he was speaking, speaking exactly with Samir, so he was shifting the right. dialect. Then Musa Huri and uh, Samir Nakash also used uh, uh, the two dialects, but also the, what is called the Muslawi or the uh, Jewish Baghdadi dialect. Now, so you even in Arabic, when you hear it, you see the multiplicity uh, and how uh, for the native Arabic speakers, the dislocation... Uh, and to whom they're speaking mm -hmm. already affect them in a kind of diagnostic uh, fashion. So it's not a unified Arabic that is spoken by the people of the same origin. And then, of course, you have the question of Hebrew, English, French. Let's not forget that some of them are educated. For example, Sami Mikhail went to Shamash School, which was British uh, with a stamp of Oxford High School uh, for the matriculation exam. Shimon On the Balas other hand, Shimon Balas at the Alliance, and you know, and that affects also. And then you have Hebrew. And you hear Hebrew in different kind of pronunciations as well. For example, when I go on official dominant television, I'm not speaking with my home Iraqi uh, accent. I'm speaking with the dominant uh, Ashkenazi European uh, because that would be uh, the norm of how you speak an intellectual uh, uh, in an intellectual conversation. So that also in itself, uh, you see people shifting, moving in and out. So it won't, be, I, I wouldn't say it's as rigid as Arabic versus Hebrew, because Arabic sometimes is also articulated in Iraqi pronunciation. I'm sorry, uh, Hebrew is articulated in Iraqi pronunciation. This was, but however, I, I, I think you're touching on a major issue for writers, making the transition, how Arabic keeps affecting and in, it, it inhabits every single, every, every uh, part of their daily activities, even when they move into Hebrew. So we can't say that the transition into Hebrew necessarily means the erasure of Arabic, even not for the second, and I would say even not for the third generation. And I'll tell you now from my own home, you know, so you saw my father, for example, in a family, Hafla, playing the Kamanja. This 
Arabic Iraqi culture continue to be part of home culture. And you have second and third generation, people who continued, who, they were not born in Iraq, and yet they continue to sing, not in the Jewish dialect, but what is called in the dominant Iraqi dialect, people who never lived in, the, uh, uh, in Iraq. Uh, and there are a series of them. I mean, uh, I, can, uh, I actually wrote about it. So in a sense, despite the fact that in the public sphere, Arabic was a taboo, in the private sphere, in the communal space of homes, it continued to exist. So on one level, you have a crisis and rupture. On the other hand, you also have continuity. And that's and now, with the kind of an attempt at Renaissance and to revive it, you have, uh, especially with the help of digital spaces, uh, you have younger generation who did not, third generation who's like inquiring into their grandparents' uh, languages and uh, trying. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, like Ziva Haskell, who, for example, he uh, uh, plays with the Palestinian orchestra in, in Nazareth. So actually, I will say more than that. Palestinians in Israel became an important vehicle uh, for the younger generation of uh, Arab Jews to continue learn, for example, the Oud, if they were not able to access it from home. Uh, on the other hand, for uh, Iraqi, Iraqis in the diaspora, non-Jewish Iraqis, I don't want to name names, they went to Israel to study uh, uh, the maqam mm -hmm. with old Iraqi uh, players. So there is a lot of cross-border activities that has been happening informally uh, uh, um, in and outside of Israel. And, and so, and of course now with the, uh, you know, with digital communication, that has been facilitated and more encouraged. So therefore, I don't believe that the rupture from Arabic necessarily means the inability to return to it, even by the younger generation, because I think there is uh, a, 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 a vital effort to do so. Thank you so much. Now I want to hand over to, to questions from the audience. Do we have one? What you told in the last instance was very, very interesting because it arises a question, was that only possible after the so-called liberation of Iraq in 2003 that, that, that Iraqis were able to visit Israel? <laughs> which, which period are we talking about to learn the old no, I, I music? Was actually I mean, no, not necessarily di directly from Iraq. It could be Iraqi Americans who, uh -huh. with American passport uh -huh. traveling uh -huh. to Israel mm -hmm. to meet Iraqi Jews there and mm -hmm. learn about uh, the Iraqi maqam because they could not travel actually to Iraq. Yes. And okay. because a lot of the musicians and uh, left or died. Uh, uh, so mm -hmm. actually in whether they in uh, and, and actually in London there have been some activities of bringing and ha paying homage for example to Salah al kuwaiti and to the Iraqi musicians who uh, for a long time especially with the rise of the Ba'ath party were erased from Iraqi history even though for example everybody all Iraqis and Arabs know Fog and Nahal you know uh, yeah. above the palm trees uh, but in the in Iraqi uh, book histories, it was just uh, mentioned as uh, a song from Minat Turaf, right, from the tradition, rather than as something that an Iraqi Jew actually who played and directed the Iraqi orchestra of the radio uh, actually wrote the song. So a lot of transformation happened. So I'm not necessarily referring to only to the so-called liberation of Iraq mm -hmm. of 2003, but rather even before that. Mm -hmm. And after that, I think the notion of uh, dialogue has been taking place, but also with a lot of anxiety on all sides, because they are crossing taboos, whether on the Israeli side of the story or on the uh, uh, Iraqi or Arab side of the story. Mm -hmm. But one small special congratulations for, for referring yourselves to Arab modernity at all. The term almost died in the last last decades, and second, 
to remind us with your work just about the fact that there are Sephardi Israelis of left wing inclinations because they do absolutely not exist in the media. They're not not in the not in Israel, not in the Arab world, not in the West, not maybe not even in Cuba's grandma. <laughs> Hi, I, I have a question about, um, actually it's more of a comment, uh, but um, also a question. Uh, the, the whole issue of um, um, Arab Jews and Arab Jewish identity and the move from Iraq to, uh, to Israel reminds me profoundly of my own biography, which is of a Punjabi Pakistani family that's moved over to India. Mm -hmm. And I had a very similar experience when coming to Germany that uh, meeting Pakistani students for the first time, I, I had the similar um, uh, moment of discovering, oh wait, we speak, um, we have the same mannerisms, the same expressions, which you don't even share with other uh, Indians that speak uh, 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 Urdu with the Punjabi uh, um, dialect. Um, but I guess my uh, the question that I want to ask is about um, in Bombay, where I grew up, you have a Baghdadi Jewish community and also in Calcutta, which then a large part of it emigrated to um, uh, to Israel. So uh, I guess what I'm curious about is if the uh, Baghdadi Jews from Bombay were part of uh, um, the Iraqi Jewish community, and and or how how did that work? Did did um, Iraqi Jew Iraqi Jews from different parts of the world form one community, or was it fractured? Mm, um. Well, uh, what happened, especially with the uh, emergence and the rise of uh, colonial powers in the region, even under the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, there was always the Silk Ro Road, right? There was always connection and merchandise going on uh, between the Arab world, uh, South Asia, uh, China, etc. But with the presence of colonial powers, uh, that kind of... Uh, movement across borders uh, was becoming more uh, intensified, shall we say. Uh, some of the uh, uh, upper class Iraqi Jews uh, ended up uh, moving to India for, uh, or Hong Kong, uh, to Burma. And that was part of the uh, trade that was allowed and facilitated by, uh, you know, colonized uh, India. They moved there, however, they were very uh, insistent on maintaining their Iraqi culture. Calcutta became a center uh, for printing um, Arabic in Hebrew letters, which was the traditional way of, uh, for uh, most Arab Jews to write uh, in their own dialects. But it was Arabic and it was uh, Iraqi culture. They brought even teachers from Baghdad to teach their children and even travelers who went to see and met those Iraqi Jews in Calcutta or Bombay in the mid-19th century testify to their insistence on speaking Arabic to their children, teaching them the mode of prayer of uh, Baghdad. And some of the books by the Baghdadi hahams, the rabbis, were actually, for example, haham, um, uh, um, I'm blocking on his name in a moment, uh, were printed uh, and published in India with the support of rich uh, merchant Iraqi Jews uh, in Calcutta and in Bombay. The connections were very, very strong. The fact that they ended up in Israel, let's come back to the question that we raised on the panel and with Kathy Wazana's film. Those are very complex reasons, and they have to do, of course, again, with the activities that were happening throughout uh, the region in relation to bringing Jews post-48. Uh, some cases, actually, there were, uh, there is even a story of actual, um, without telling the parents in Bombay, uh, af around the time of 48, children were promised that they were taken into a field trip and taken into, uh, on an airplane, and then were taken, children, not children, but adolescent, and were taken to Israel without the permission of their parents. This, thing, this was happening also in Iraq. So the question of, uh, I would add to this idea of departing from Arab uh, and other countries 
was not always so voluntary as we, we may remember. But the connection, and even 100 years later, those Indian Jews continued at home to speak their uh, uh, Arabic, uh, the Baghdad, usually the Baghdadi dialect. Um, just one comment. This is uh, today is the universal day of the invasion of Iraq, so the fall of Baghdad. So maybe it's uh, something that you could uh, talk about. Um, and um, my question refers to the political announcements that they were hidden in the movie, from my understanding. Um, the one from Samir Naqash that he is not sure if this country going to do well to his grandparents. The fact that they, the children, yes. Um, and uh, the fact that they don't speak Arabic. And the fact that um, you decide not to live in Israel. Um, how far is really that um, Israel succeed? with the raising the Israeli or the Arabic Jewish identity of this minority? <laughs> About uh, the, yeah, I mean, uh, this is no, this is, no, <laughs> this is nothing to celebrate. So, I, you know, I, I uh, try to avoid <laughs> this. No, because this, you said before the liberation, so I was like, yeah, if you see my new f if you see my new film, I refer uh, very much to that, and I start uh, with this catastrophe. And uh, you know, the the sad thing was uh, last. You know, I made this film two thousand two. I finished it in in July, and at the same time when I was finishing it, there was a whole the reunions in London and in Amsterdam of the opposition, the Iraqi opposition. Should they support the invasion or not? Uh, however, I, I, of course, I, I was against it. I, I was very active in the movement against the war. But we didn't succeed it, like one million in London, um, 100,000 in New York. You know, I mean, we, we didn't succeed it, but we, we were right. This war was wrong. And the occupation uh, destabilized uh, the Iraq even more. Yeah, so in that sense, um, I don't know what to say on that. You know, I mean, this is obvious, obvious for any reasonable person. And uh, the other question about uh, Israel, maybe Ella will talk about. I mean, uh, I have I have um, another film here as a producer. Um, uh, when I entered the garden uh, from Avi Mohrabi, which is an Israeli filmmaker, which I have co-produced. And he is also telling st his story uh, of, you know, like he moved, uh, he, he remembers the stories which were also hidden <laughs> about uh, his family, which was uh, his grandfather in, in Damascus and in, in Beirut. And they, you know, they were traveling around in the 20s without <coughs> any th sense of idea what, what, what could happen, you know. It was just normal. The, he shows even in the film um, a th telephone book in the three languages, you know, in English, Hebrew, and Arabic, you know. And, and he tells the story through his Arabic teacher, you know, his friend, which, is, which has... Which, which is one of the rare species which married <laughs> a Jewish Israeli. <laughs> and um, he's uh, between everything. But of course, he teaches him the Arabic in a, let's say, political way. And uh, it's a nice film to see anyway. But uh, this is also a side note, what's going on in Israel. You know, I, I, d I don't believe that, you know, if you see uh, the future of Israel, that it's possible, you know, to to escape the Middle East. I mean, <laughs> it's, 
it's im not imaginable, you know. So, but maybe uh, you will talk about that. Yeah, no, I wanted actually to speak about the film. And uh, although the question of the Arab Jew is uh, dominant in the film, it obviously contextualizes it uh, in relation to colonialism, in relation to Zionism, and also uh, in relation to Palestinians in Israel. Because uh, for those of you who may identify, there is a photo of uh, Shimon Balas with Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, there is Sami Michael with Emil Habibi. Uh, so even when it's not told directly, the question of that solidarity and that history of working together is very much, uh, uh, both in Iraq and also in Israel-Palestine, is very much uh, present uh, uh, in the film. Uh, I think what I believe this film has done is to help put on the map uh, an, uh, both a, a hidden history, the story of how we were exiled from Iraq, uh, in this case, uh, that it wasn't necessarily an idea of wanting to go there. But I think the fact that you have especially communist Iraqi Jews who did not want to go there, and, and you see that uh, uh, sense of Iraqiness, and they not only believe in a kind of a universal ideal of justice and equality, but also at the same time feel uh, uh, belonging to Iraqi culture, that they would end up in a place that did not want to be there. Uh, it's a permanent exile, right? And so it's a story that helps put on the map that goes against the grain of the Zionist narrative in which people simply chose to, uh, to, to move to Israel. And I think this comes across in all of the films that are selected here. Uh, uh, they're all deconstructing uh, uh, that simplistic uh, uh, narrative. At the same time, they're not just about the past. And I think that all of those films here, uh, and certainly forget Baghdad, are about trying to imagine an alternative through digging into that past. And that alternative comes uh, uh, not by using the question of the Arab Jew against Palestinians which it often is the case, either by, you know, you refer to the media not representing Mizrahim or Arab Jews, but of course it has, it's a whole history in which Mizrahi, Mizra, the Mizrahi left has been silenced uh, for many, many generations, not to speak about the, uh, Arab, the older generation of uh, Iraqi, Moroccan commu Jewish communists, for example. All of that narrative uh, now is being told, and there is, I think, greater, greater interest in, in uh, exploring it, listening to it, and try to see. I mean, recently, actually, uh, whatever one thinks of uh, Abu Mazen or uh, 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 Abbas, right, uh, invited uh, Sami Mikhail to come and visit him to try to think together about uh, alternatives. He was the guest of the Palestinian Authority for three days, three intense days. Um, and everybody, this is now a, a private story <laughs> that uh, um, uh, uh, him and his wife told me that uh, apparently everyone said that Abbas was very depressed until Sami Mikhail came. And you know they had a reason to talk and think about uh, uh, a different kind of future because Sami Mikhail, for example, uh, is very much involved with citizens' rights and fighting uh, against racism within Israeli society. So I think um, the only possibility, of course, is to transform uh, uh, the situation in Israel-Palestine as we know, uh, but not by uh, having those Orientalist discourses about, uh, you know, the Mizrahim uh, as being racist. Uh, uh, toward the Arabs. Those are the narratives that we heard over and over again. And they don't help uh, uh, the situation by pitting Palestinians against Mizrahim and, and vice versa. So I think this is the importance of work like this because it allows us uh, to think beyond the cliches. Thank you very much, the two of you, Director Samir and Ella Shohat, for this interesting Q&A. We are trying to secure uh, an, another screening of this very important film on Monday. Uh, so please follow up on Facebook and our website for more details. Thank you again for being here and answering all that. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you for being here. <laughs>